we are going to head into our health panel now. And the idea of the health panel is how can business, how can government, how can companies work together so that we're more health resilient? We have universal health care and food security as well. If you would like to be part of that conversation, be part of that conversation. Jump into the chat on the conference platform. I know you're there already and we will be ready to start the panel. It is just 30 minutes long, so do not sit there and wait. Jump right in. Let's start the panel. Good to see you, panel. Hello. Welcome to the Leaders Summit. We are going to be talking about uniting to build a health resilient world. So first of all, we want to tell our audience, the delegates who are watching, who you are. And I am going to get you to do your own introductions. Mr. Minister, nice to see you. Welcome to the Leaders Summit. Introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good, good evening or good afternoon. It depends where you are. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be nominated by the head of state, President Nussi, to be present to this uh, discussion. My name is Carlos Mesquita, and I'm standing as a Minister of uh, Industry and Trade for Mozambique. Thank you. It is very good to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Katrine, welcome to the conversation. Please tell everybody who you are. Also, I'm delighted to be here in this panel. My name is Katrin Valare, and I work for uh, Danone, uh, which is a known food company. And my real passion is to make sure that people get the right nutrition for health. So I'm very happy to be part of this. Very happy to have you. And finally, Phil, welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the panel. Tell everybody who you are. Thanks, Femi. Hello. Uh, my name is Phil Thompson. I'm on the Xcode GSK, and uh, we are a life sciences company, obviously very focused and involved in the response to COVID-19 right now. Wonderful. Panelists, you're all over the world, but do not let that stop you from asking each other questions, doing follow-ups as well. I've been doing this for hours and hours. I need your support. You are the experts. Do not be shy about bringing your expertise to the floor. Ministers are never shy about sharing their expertise. Mr. Minister, I will start with you. I can see you in your conference room. You are social distancing. One or two people have a mask on. So it tells me that right now in Mozambique, of course, you are dealing with COVID-19. How will it change the way you look at health and health services because of this global pandemic? Well, indeed, I should uh, first of all apologize that I'm not using masks, but you know, uh, I've got it right here close to me. And the social distance between us, you can also see what's the procedures in Mozambique, not different from what you see everywhere in the, everywhere in the world. But uh, the point is, uh, in our uh, discussions in Mozambique, we see life as uh, already a center in itself for its immeasurable value. And COVID, however, has highlighted life as a good and true DNA of the structure of the global economy. In order to protect life fields, COVID imposed an agenda that redirects the way we saw and understand the architecture of the global economy. Uh, in order to reconsider the classifications of productive sectors and the inequalities of the national health systems. Combine scientific research with a social cultural contest in each nation state that researches and development stages are of a paramount importance for pharmaceuticals. Also to admit that uh, we now live in a cusp of fifth industrial revolution, if I may say so driven by human-centered technological innovation. Reiterate also, agriculture is a link between production chains, including the family and informal structures. And finally, to recognize the possibility of a public health, 
crisis halting the course of the global economy. However, because of the new value ascribed of human life, COVID ignited a new global agenda where the path of innovation must be replicated in public health service provision, technologies and digitalization should massify local health support solutions, as well as there is a room to optimize economic integration models, special on mobility and infrastructures. We must so reflect Minister, on whether it... Yes? Mr. Minister, if I may, I, I asked you a very direct question and I wanted to ask you outside of your ministerial duties, obviously, because there's a lot of things that you have to talk about, but I just wanted to be very yep. clear, COVID-19, how does that change your health service? Very much so. First of all, because of the uh, pressure that is, is bringing to, to our country, and we should not forget, unfortunately, Mozambique is coming out from uh, some natural disasters like Idai and Kenneth, which have occurred last year, which has already put much pressure on our health system. And then all, all of a sudden, in about a year time, this COVID comes again to put additional pressure on our system. And it requires a lot of uh, synergies to organize and to prepare for something that nobody knows what it is about and how to, to, how to, to resolve this problem. So it's something new for all of us, but we need to have a proper coordination with the old health authorities and also the government is putting a lot of support on that. Of course, and Mozambique is in a situation that many countries are in, whether they're in the global north or the global south, where I've never had to cope with this before. What is the plan? Katrine, coming to you, just thinking about how do we use this moment? How do we use this moment positively? And we're also thinking about yes. food security, which is an area that I know, and nutrition, that you work in. Can you extrapolate that for us a little bit so we understand the expertise that you're bringing to our conversation? Yeah, um, as you know, and I think all around the table and here, we know that and food is like connected. There's no way that uh, can see without. And I think we also saw that in this uh, pandemic, being well fed is very important to on one hand prevent, but also fight uh, finally. But then indeed, having said that, it's of utmost importance that we secure the value chain and that we provide indeed food security. And you know, we can only do that if you truly connect to the communities that you're working with. We are working with farmers, with uh, suppliers, small you know, we are one. We are one chain also together with the patients, with the healthcare professionals. If you don't do that, we will not be able to sustain that. And in times like that, businesses really should take care of the communities they're part of. We need to do it together to make sure that indeed in the future also, and we recover from this uh, pandemic. Thank you, Phil. I, I, I know you're thinking about lessons learned already. We're, we're still in a global pandemic. Are you in the UK, Phil? I am, I am indeed. Yeah, yes, you're in the UK. All, all right, so, so you watch the news, you know what's going on in the UK. Uh, COVID cases are, are still a very serious uh, situation in the UK. So we're not even out of the woods yet. And you're thinking about lessons learned. Tell us about lessons learned and why. Well, I think, Johnny, you know, <clears throat> first and foremost, this, um, as the Secretary General said in his opening remarks, this is beyond the global health crisis. In fact, it's a very stark reappraisal of how health resilient we are globally. And you're quite right, here in the UK, we are still facing a very significant challenge. But the reality is actually the challenge is everywhere right now. And um, particularly if you think about emerging uh, economies and developing countries, as the minister just said, you know, really we have yet to see the full impact of COVID in these markets. And that's going to come on top of all the global economic shocks that these markets face as well. 
And I, I saw, you know, just recently uh, a, fact, a figure of $2.5 trillion being estimated just purely for emerging markets and developing countries alone for the support that they are going to need on the back of COVID. So you're quite right. You know, we are very much in the foothills of this pandemic. And we really need to be thinking about lessons learned over a very long period of time. There are lessons to learn, not least because actually we had multiple warnings of this pandemic, uh, really since 2000. If you think about it, there was probably sort of seven or eight potential cases of a pandemic. And fundamentally, what we've failed to do as a global community is invest in pandemic preparedness. And we're now seeing the results of that. And I think if there was one thing that I wanted to leave the uh, conference today understanding is that we have to invest in pandemic preparedness going forward. If we are really serious about sustainable development goals, health resiliency, pandemic preparedness is an area that we have failed in. And there are many options for us to invest. I believe there is the opportunity uh, to invest, and, and I mean that both from a government, business, academic uh, perspective. But we really have to uh, focus on that. And one of the biggest lessons we can learn is investing in that preparation. I have a really interesting question. And I, I said to the team, do not just give me soft, easy questions. Ask some tough questions. So Elsa, Elsa is chatting. She's watching. She's one of the delegates here. She wanted to know, Phil, and she wanted to know, Katrine, why are you representing good health? She calls you big pharma and a multinational representing good health. But the idea of this conference, the global, the UN Global Compact, is that businesses work together to get the SDGs done, to get development done. So she's pushing you, she's poking you, Katrine. Why are you even in the panel? What would be your response to Elsa? Oh, yes. I know it will be a robust one. Yeah, of course. As I said already before, uh, you know, if you talk health, you talk food. And indeed, as a big food company, we are in the position of changing things. Me, myself, I'm working in the area of, uh, with Danone specialized nutrition. And probably you even don't know, but there is nutrition really targeting those very vulnerable patients. Our patients are COVID patients. They left hospital with in incentive uh, muscle loss. This needs to be fed. Nutrition is there to build, you know, health. And definitely a food company has on one hand uh, the size, but also the responsibility together with the partners, the partners building really partnerships with, as I said before, the communities they're part of, but also partnerships with the healthcare system to make sure that patients are treated well, but also, as uh, said in the previous, that we prepare to make sure that communities are health resilient. And food and food companies have an important role in that. Elsa goes on to say that She'd like to see from, she'd like to hear from organic food and natural remedies, companies who do that. Elsa, there are 17,000 of us. We are networking. You are part of that conversation as you just proved. Uh, Phil, I'm sure you've heard yourself called Big Pharma Phil before. Uh, what is your, what, your normal response to that? Because what we're trying to do is dig deeper beyond our normal prejudices, right? Or maybe I just created that Big Pharma Phil. <laughs> but if we're going to work together and we're going to get health resilience, I, maybe we have to get rid of some of the stereotypes. Phil, you answer for yourself. I know you're capable of doing that. Well, thank you. I, I've never been called Big Pharma Phil before, but thank you for that nomenclature. Listen, I actually see myself working. For, I actually see myself working for Life Sciences, and the clue there is in the title: Life and Sciences. And I'll, I'll just say this to Ella: If you think about where we are right now, I can tell you that vaccines are going to be the exit plan for COVID nineteen, and you know we are seeing an explosion in technology around vaccines right now. But without those, we are really going to struggle to really contain, control and move on from this virus. And the only uh, proven model for innovation is really the life sciences industry working 
in collaboration with academia, other companies, the biotech sector, the manufacturers in the pharmaceutical sector, amazing NGOs like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and of course, the World Health Organization. And I would simply say to Ella that, you know, as somebody that works and has worked in Big Pharma for the last 20 years, and I came into this all into the industry at the time when uh, industry really was not holding its head high and was doing the wrong thing in South Africa with HIV AIDS uh, medicines. This industry has come an enormously long way. And I would ask her to be open minded and to look at the industry and look at what the industry is doing right now, collaborating across all those different stakeholders that I just talked about to basically bring many, many different vaccines to help rid the world of COVID-19. Mr. Minister, I want to go back to the original reason we all got together to have this conversation. Is this was how can business and government come together for universal health care, for health resilience, for food security? How do you see that from your perspective in Mozambique? How do you work better with business? Well, uh, it is time that uh, we all have to think about the pandemic. Uh, we know that uh, business quite often, probably even always, has got a, a sense of a profit. And uh, this is a time where we should look into this aspect and be careful. Because not only with business, but all along the world, you can be so strong as the weakest point of the chain meaning that we need to have an inclusive approach the way we live from now on. Because one may think that uh, being standing alone and trying to implement good measures for its own country and then looking for the others, probably it might not help because of the flexibility and mobility that we have nowadays. It might not impact on the efforts that you've been doing yourself alone. Therefore, private sector, government officials, NGOs, and all the authorities, we have to work together. And of course, country to country, we have got our own specifics. For instance, in Mozambique, when we say that, uh, and this goes all over, prevention, stay at home. Yeah, it's very easy. How long are you going to stay at home? There are people, not only in Mozambique, but in Africa, that they need to go out every single day to get the next meal of the day. There is no way that the meal or the goods will come to the, the, the day table, either because they have to make money to buy or they have to go out and buy the foods. So these sort of things, culturally, we have to see exactly how we implement it. There are children that we say, okay, you're not going to school, stay home. But we should not forget that some of these children, they live with old parents, grandpas, and so on, and they cannot work. They have to send the children outside and to get some food to bring. So how do you deal with these things? We need together with the private sector to try to build a system of a supply chain that we can help to minimize all this. Otherwise, you can do being doing very good somewhere, but if we in Africa, we continue not to do it properly, then we go back to square one, and this will not have any, any advantages to anybody. So we have to fight it together. I am just reminding viewers, if they're just joining, you're just switching around from our conference platform. This conversation is about building health resilience. How can governments, how can businesses work together universal health care? That would be fantastic to have that, to have health resilience to so the next global pandemic, the next one, we're hardly through this one. We are better prepared and also food security is incredibly important. As the minister from Mozambique was just saying there, if you ask people to stay at home, they need to be able to eat as well. I'm going to say hello to Catherine, Catherine Balpataki. Catherine is one of the delegates. Katrine, I'm going to put her comment to you. Uh, and Catherine says, nutrition and health are both dependent on the health of soils, water and biodiversity. Food companies have an incredibly important role to play. Katrine, pick up from that thought there. 
I fully agree with what, Pat, what Catherine says. And I think indeed, uh, probably, uh, you know, as also as Danon, we have a very important stake there. But again, it's not one company, it's all of us doing that together to secure this food, because indeed it's so interconnected. And um, if we want to be prepared or we will be united for health, securing that is a key thing that governance companies should work on. So I'm very much aligned with my name, uh, fellow Catherine there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Phil, this is such an exceptional time that we're all in in this world. And I have seen a lot of collaboration, but when we talk about multi-stakeholder collaboration on that very, very, very high level, what are you seeing? What can you tell us that might actually encourage us? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think that's a really good point, Femi, because I think what we are seeing, if there are some silver linings from COVID-19, is an enormous spirit of collaboration. Now, being honest, could it have happened faster? Yes. Uh, and I think particularly around at the international levels, I think we still want and need great, great degrees of collaboration. But what I'm seeing within, certainly within my industry, is I would say genuinely unprecedented levels of collaboration as companies come together to share ideas, scientific ideas, as well as manufacturing capacity. But it's beyond that. If I think about what I've just seen with the WHO, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, uh, what I'm seeing with leaders like President Macron, uh, we are seeing really bold, collaborative ideas being put forward as part of this pandemic. And not least, in, in, to, to allow the uh, development of vaccines in the short term. The question for me, and I think for this organisation and for the UN Global Compact, is how do we translate that? How do we take that forward? Because the minister was absolutely right. This is about inclusive working and inclusive partnership. I, I thought he put that very, very well. The, 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 the aspect for me is, if we can do this in a pandemic, how do we do it even more broadly? when we think about health resilience beyond just the pandemic? How do we translate the collaboration we're starting to see now into something even bigger and bolder? And I think the UN Global Compact could really play a role here. Phil, you can't actually tell people what you do without them asking you questions about vaccines. If we were allowed to go to parties, I know everybody would be asking you these questions. So as you hear, and we're live, I'm gonna put Noria Chen's question to you. She wanted to know, any updates on vaccines? Yes, there are, there are many, many updates on vaccines. I mean, I think what I, what I said earlier is that one of the very exciting uh, uh, results, certainly within the industry around what's happening now, is that we are seeing many, many different developments across lots of, vi lots of different vaccine technologies. Now, this is good news because not least does it mean that we can move forward on the pandemic, but actually we'll be able to move forward even more broadly along across other infectious diseases if some of these new technologies start to emerge. What I think we're going to start seeing more and more in the next few months is more and more data from some of the different vaccines. And then we'll start to see uh, what, I, what I think will be a, a large pro pro group of projects start to distill down into a, a, a smaller group of vaccines, which we hope and should be made available as equitably as possible across the world. I'm actually very optimistic that we will get to uh, the right number of vaccines. Uh, I'm optimistic that the industry will work together to help uh, manufacture the vaccines, which is extraordinarily important. And I'm actually optimistic that governments are going to work together to make sure that everybody, whether it's developed countries or developing countries, are going to make the vaccines as available as widely as possible. So I think um, the answer to the uh, question Phil, is... Phil, you, you, you read Hazel James's mind because she was really curious about vaccines and you answered a lot of her questions. And another person who's, who's in, in our conference, but she was also worried about people who are extremely poor, in conflict zones, in refugee camps. And so you're saying... This is the partnership bit. This is like the government has to do that bit. You'll make the vaccines, hopefully. And then the government has to work out how to get it to their people. 
Well, I think, I think it's on both of us, actually. I would say governments and industry, but also I would say very importantly, some of the major NGOs have a big role to play here. I mentioned Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation earlier. Uh, Gavi, the uh, Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, is a very, very important partner, as is UNICEF. And I, I think, you know, what we've seen from these organisations over the last couple of months is some incredible energy coming together to think about how do you make the vaccines available? If I think about what Bill Gates and the foundation have called for, which is manufacturing at scale, at risk, working with partners in India and other, and other countries, Gavi stepping up to the plate to really say that they will be the partner which will help get uh, vaccines available to countries. And then lots of companies like my, my own included talking about donations of vaccines to make sure that we get vaccines available to developing countries. So I hope with that, we should uh, be able to achieve what, what was exactly behind Hazel and your question. Uh -huh. Minister, I have a question for you. It came from Bitra George. Uh, Bitra George is online right now. Uh, and I'm just curious, as is Bitra George, are there concrete examples of multinational companies assisting governments in resource constrained settings with prevention, management and post care of COVID-19 patients? Are those big companies, are they coming to help you? Well, actually, there are uh, companies also, of course, but uh, throughout our, our diplomatic uh, cooperations, uh, either bilateral or multilateral, there are quite a lot of uh, funds coming uh, in order to, to, to support the whole scheme here in Mozambique. And uh, I have to say that it is working well. They are quite busy also giving us some, some technical support and some plans and so on. But uh, definitely, my, my, my think my th should be that, yes, indeed, vaccines is one of them that we should consider. But I would probably look it into two, uh, two folds. Because, uh, yeah, let me tell you this. We are also living with malaria here in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And this is killing mm -hmm. probably as much as uh, this COVID is also yeah. killing. And there are no vaccines for malaria. So we should have seen vaccines, but also try to see medicines in order to, to facilitate the recuperation of, 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 the, of the people. And Minister, that you reminded me that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, they have a measles, measles, excuse me, a measles outbreak as well. So while all of us are focused on COVID-19 and looking for a vaccine for there, uh, some people are not getting vaccination, vaccinated for uh, diseases that we already know that we have the cures for. So. The, we, we have to keep my eye on everything. We can't just focus on one thing. We have to talk about everything. This panel was about health resilience. How can governments and businesses work together? We want health resilience, universal health care, still striving for that, and also food security. I am curious, and, and, and uh, panel, I'm going to ask you to do this. In a sentence, your mood right now, what is the mood that you want to leave our audience with? Katrine, go ahead. My mood is really that if we are united together, and I think really this is the theme of this uh, session, we really can bring health after or during this pandemic and also after. But it will be essential that we are being seen as all together. Businesses, mm -hmm. governments, uh, NGOs, uh, thinking about what, why are we here? We are ah. here to bring health to the world. And we can do that, but we need to work together, even the industries among each other, uh, the governance. So I, I see this and I'm feeling very positive based on this Good. movement. And I think we learned so much thanks to uh, what happened. Okay, all right. Uh, positive mood. That's, this is good. This is encouraging. Phil, your mood. Final sentence. What is it? Well, I, I think um, I think the two words, at least, that came to mind for me when we asked that question was urgency and collaboration. I, I genuinely think that COVID means that we have to invest in pandemic preparedness. We've got to invest in prevention and really focus there. And I think what we should do is capture the best of the urgency that the pandemic has given us translate that into the collaboration we are seeing on a much broader front 
than just pandemic across all the different domains of healthcare to really translate that into something that could be very positive and supportive of the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And finally, Minister, your mood right now in a sentence, remembering that we're talking about health resilience in the middle of a COVID-19 crisis, what is your mood? We should have the, the world more united. I mean, the, the countries in the world more united. It doesn't matter. We, this, this, this pandemic has shown to us that uh, it doesn't matter how big your bank account looks like because when you are in, in problems, when you think that you're going to die, then all these uh, big values doesn't mean anything. So I will finish my, 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 my intervention saying that invest in food security through industrialized agriculture. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Minister. Thank you, Katrine. Thank you, Phil. Yes. Really appreciate your thoughts. Thank you, delegates. Great questions. Tough ones. Like that a lot. Thank you very much.